Good afternoon. I'm Ariana cohen Halberstam. I'm the Artistic Director of Boston Jewish Film and the Boston Israeli Film Festival. Welcome to our third annual festival. I want to thank our festival sponsors, the festival's presenting sponsor, the Fine Family Foundation and CJP. Also a huge thanks to the Consulate of Israel to New England and to the IAC. And a special thanks in this screening to the Boston Women's Film Festival who are partnering on this screening. The festival continues through Wednesday, March 10th. We have events coming up every day, including today, another event at 4 p.m. for the film Rock for the Time Machine. Um, it will be a great conversation and I hope you can join us for that as well. We are so pleased that the director of Rain in Her Eyes is with us here today, uh, Ron Omer is Devorah Omer's son, as you would know from the film. Um, and while this is his directorial debut, we have seen his work at the festival uh, many times. He is the editor of Who's Going to Love Me, Who's Going to Love Me Now, which closed our 2016 Boston Jewish Film Festival. He edited Mr. Gaga, which we premiered before it was released in theaters in Boston, and has won three awards from the Israeli Academy Awards. Um, so welcome, Ron. We're so glad to have you here with us today. Um, and Ron will be interviewed today by Yael Marks, who is an educator and literature teacher um, who runs a bi-weekly uh, book club focused on Hebrew literature. So has, we'll have a lot to talk about with Ron. In about 20 minutes, Yael will be opening up the conversation from, for, with questions from you guys. So if you have questions about the film, questions for Ron, please enter them into the Q&A section um, below on the screen. Uh, yeah, I'll take it away. Uh, hello. Hi, Ron. Hi, everybody. <laughs> hi, everybody. I was debating with myself if I should say hi, Ron, or hi, Ron, in a very Israeli accent. I decided to say Ron. I'm really excited to be here today. And I will start with my um, my experience with uh, Dvora Omer's books. When I was a kid, I really loved your, your mother's books. And I think all my friends read them and it was part of our life and part, and I remember me really getting involved with the characters, especially uh, Sarah Aronson, Sarah Gibrat Nili. I remember reading it, especially the last part of the book and trying, reading over and over again, trying to find that maybe there is a chance that she didn't die. Uh, and I was really sad. So this is just an example for me really growing up reading those books and, and really inspired by them. Um, when your, your daughter came from school and said, I don't think uh, my, my friends knows who is Dvora Omer. Was this the first time you thought it will be a good time to, to make a movie, to direct a movie? Yes, as, as Ariana said already, I'm a film editor. I never thought I'm going to direct a film. It's a really, really hard job to direct. And I was uh, very afraid to change the uh, position to, the, to be a director. Uh, so um, when my daughter came back home and said that none of the kids knew who Dvora Omer was, this is, was uh, the point that I decided to, to make this film. And when I started uh, digging into the materials, I also understood it's uh, too good of a story not to make it uh, a film of, of it. Yeah. I wonder, how did you find a balance between you as a director, editor, a professional, you know, movie maker, and the fact that you are part of that story because genetically you are part of this story. How did you manage that? It's a very good question and it's the hardest question uh, for me. Um, I, I'm going to tell you, I, I'm going to give you an example uh, 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 how I thought I'm gonna make the film, and uh, after you saw the film, you, you, you understand how I ended uh, making uh, the film. At the first day of shooting, we shoot uh, my father. And before we started rolling the camera, I told him, Daddy, 
if you're gonna talk about mom, don't say mom, say Dvora Omer. So I can be um, behind the camera as a, as a director, any director, and I, I, I'm not gonna take the part of the son. Very soon I understood that it's, it's the wrong uh, uh, starting point for this project because I'm the son of the, of the hero of the film and I must take uh, some kind of uh, a position uh, in this role. And uh, this was the hardest thing for me to, I didn't want to make a film about myself. I wanted to make a film about Dvor Oma that many kids grew up on her books. And um, I knew I'm not gonna make a, a it's called iMovie when, you, when they, the, the, the filmmaker is making a film about himself. And a um, lot of scenes that I'm in it were uh, left uh, be, uh, outside of the film. And it took me a long uh, process to, to find the, the, the precise uh, uh, role uh, of me being in the film. But you know, I'm a film editor, as I said, and uh, it helped me a lot. I spent uh, two and a half years of making this film uh, two years in the editing room. And you, as you can imagine, uh, to spend two years, 10 hours a day with your dead mom there in the editing room can be very, very uh, tough uh, mission. But I immediately uh, wear the hat of the professional editor and I knew that I have to make a film. And it helped me a lot in one uh, side to, to, to be uh, not so close emotionally to the film, to the story, and to make a film. My biggest fear was that I'm going to make a film that's going to interest only my family. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, 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 I took the, 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 uh, my uh, skills as an editor who edit many, many films and put them in this film. So it's like being the son of, of Dvora Omer, the son of a great author, editor, director, but also kind of trying to think what will be uh, the reaction of the audience also, right? Because he wanted to make it a excited and touching for everybody. And I have to say personally, I love this movie. It's so, it feels to me like so gentle in touching everything. It's emotional, but not too emotional. It's not, it's, it's so beautiful. Um, so yeah. <laughs> I wanna ask another question. Let's imagine we put Dvo Omers in a time machine and she's with us today here with you or with me or with uh, Ariana. And, and she is part of this um, excitement what will be her reaction? What maybe there will be a message that she will want to convey? What do you think? You're asking the best questions. Um, it's something I, I think about it a lot because my mother, she was very shy. She was very private. And I'm not sure that she would have been so happy with this, this film and this kind of uh, a film. I, I don't have uh, the answer, but I can tell you that after the film uh, went out and my father and my brother saw it a few times, he called me one day and he said, you know, I think mom would have liked, would love the film. And I was so happy he said that. It made me so uh, uh, happy because it's a question I'm asking myself. And uh, I think in one part, she wouldn't like it. In the other hand, she would understand because she wrote about historical uh, heroes, and she knew how to put inside the emotions, the, the, not to, to put them on a pedestal that they were perfect. They had the scars and wounds, and she wrote about the scars and the wounds. And also I, in this film, I knew that I have to bring her character as a whole, with the wounds, with the scars, with the in, in, imperfection. This is what make us, uh, connect and interact with, with the character. And then that brings me to the next question about her character. 
uh, I watched an interview with her, one hour and a half interview with her. And I said to myself, she is a grown up woman, maybe she was 80 or 70 something, and she looks to me so gullible, so um, very, very sensitive, maybe a little bit naive. Um, and I wonder, maybe it's a very personal question, but you are also as her son, how did it influence you as uh, her son growing up in, in this house with a very, not childish, but a very gullible, sensitive person? As a child, I didn't understand that something is different with my mom. This is the way she was. And I really loved her and I was very happy as a child. And I didn't feel that anything is missing from my life. When I became a father and I watched my wife uh, as a mother, then I understood that, okay, this is how a mother should be. Um, my mother was very, very, very sensitive person. And uh, we as, as kids, we understood that we cannot uh, lean on her too much uh, with uh, things that can be hurt, hurtful for her. And, uh, but we did it with, with great love uh, to protect her, uh, to be gentle with her. Uh, she was really a child uh, with the rain in her eyes. Uh, so uh, this is the way we grew up. I, I was the, um, she was, I'm the last one. She, uh, I, uh, I, my brother and my sister uh, grew up with a different mother. She was much more wounded. When I came into her life, she was after uh, um, uh, discovering what happened to her mom, she was, she was happier. Uh, but uh, luckily, uh, um, I got a, a better mom than, than they did. Yeah, I can identify with that about being a second generation of the Holocaust. It's not a same, but being the youngest, I got parents that were less in that experience and more in the future, present and future. So I really can identify with you. Do you think that her being so sensitive and her history and the story of her family uh, was a trait, like a trait that really made her uh, books available and friendly used by our generation more than if she was like, I don't know, a regular grown up. I think we don't see Ron. Is there any? It looks like Ron dropped off. Let's, re let's get him to reconnect. Okay, maybe, yeah, we should. I'll, I'll just talk about the uh, next question will be about Dvora Omer's character is part of her being able to connect with children uh, in her books. I'd love to, while, while Ron is reconnecting, if, if you can tell us a little bit about reading Devorah Omer when you were a kid and, so, and your relationship to sure. her. So I started, I started, I, I think I said to Ron first in my quote, first question, and I'll say it again, just um, reading again, Sarah Giborat Nili. I really love that character. I thought that Avshalom chose her sister over her in a romantic way was not something that I agreed with. And, I, and her death in the end, um, I really wanted to check if I missed something, if I misread it and, uh, and I really wanted her to be alive. I can talk about also um, Eliezer ben Yehuda, the story about Eliezer ben Yehuda's son. That was so special that um, she gave a voice. Hi, everybody. Sorry for that. Something went wrong with the internet or my camera. I don't know, but I'm back. You hear me? Well, welcome back. 
Welcome um, Yael was just talking about her memories of your mother's books, but uh, I'm going to leave you don't hear the you. Uh, Let me try to fix it. You're with us, but... No, I can't hear you. Oh, you cannot hear me. Do you hear me, Ron? Okay, so while Ron figures that out, I, I please yeah, I'll continue with the Bechor Levetavi. So it was a very special approach. Now I can hear you. I will just finish my sentence, Ron. I'm talking about your mother's book, Bechor Levetavi, the story about the, the son of Eliezer ben Yehuda, one of my favorites. And I said to Ariana that it was fascinating to, to see that your mother, Dvo Omer, gave a voice to a kid. He was a hero, Eliezer ben Yehuda, but his son was really suffering for his extreme views, beautiful views um, that brought the Hebrew to life. But, and this connects to my question about, was it a trait that she was a little bit gullible, naive, and maybe a little bit a child and younger in her spirit to bring this voice to, the, to the, her books? I, absolutely, I think the, she was she was a child all her life, and she knew how to uh, connect with children, and she also believed that there is no emotion that children cannot be uh, deal with, and she wrote about very hard uh, feelings and uh, emotions in her books, and uh, uh, usually kids or youth uh, finished uh, reading her books uh, crying, and. Um, you know, I also discovered in, in the, while making the film that my mother wrote about historical heroes, but she wrote about herself, about her own wounds again and again and again by telling the story of those historical uh, heroes about uh, these kids that uh, was left behind for the dream of the establishment of the uh, state of Israel the Zionist dream. Her father writing to her a letter that he's got something really important to do to help uh, the, the Holocaust uh, survivors. And she's got the kibbutz to take care of her. Uh, my daughter, is, she's uh, uh, 12 years old. I cannot imagine writing something to her like that. But uh, she grew up in a, in a generation that this is what was part of what people did. And so in one hand, she's really admiring these historical figures, but on the other hand, she's keep writing on the prices their families or kids uh, paid for these dreams. Yeah, yeah. Um, how did you choose who to interview in your film and how much? Um, it was a process. We did the research, and uh, I, I knew that I want to bring the voice of the generation of the uh, readers who read her books. And I knew that I don't want to bring a academic academic uh, uh, people that's going to talk about her uh, writing and literature. I knew that I need someone that's going to speak about it from an emotion uh, perspective. Uh, someone that remember uh, the feeling of uh, laying on, on his bed in his room and uh, reading these books and cry. Uh, so I found people that write and uh, that were kids in this uh, time. Yeah. They're part of the generation. And, um, and you're not a lot in the film, you yourself. Uh, and I wanted, I wanted to see you more just because I knew that I'm going to interview you. And I said, oh, he was very, very, you, you didn't put yourself a lot in the film. Was it a, a professional decision or emotional or both? It was both. You know, it was very hard for me to see myself in the film. And I didn't want to take a part of being a, someone that interview the people. Um, and to be on camera while I'm interviewing. 
I didn't uh, think it's 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 the, the kind of film I want to make, and I also uh, felt that by taking the part of the person who is reading the text from the books, I'm putting something of myself uh, into the film, and um, I, I think it it was right for me the the amount that I was shown in the film, and. Do you have, um, maybe it's too early, I don't know, do you think about your next documentary as a director? I am, I, I, it felt great, you know, I worked on the film for, film for two and a half years, and while I was uh, about to finish the work, to finish the film, I was, I, one morning I, I was uh, waking up and almost with tears told my wife, what I'm gonna do now when it's gonna be over? And it was so fulfilling and it it's, uh, swept me away. And it was a lifetime mission. Uh, and yes, I, I uh, want to direct more. Uh, it's not gonna be easy to find a project that's gonna uh, fill me uh, in, in this uh, ex extent, but hopefully it will come. And I think Ariana is going to help us with the Q and A question now is it okay to you? Yeah, sure. Jump we have in. we have we have some questions coming in from the audience. Um, actually, two of these questions are are, are similar, um, so I'll I'll start with those. Um, one is about why you think it is that your daughter's generation um, doesn't read Devar Omer, um, and if these books are sort of um, if they could have been written today or if they're of a time in Israel, which I'm gonna to link to the next question from Jamie, which is uh, why, are the book, why are the books no longer read in Israel and were they ever successful in other countries? So if you can talk a little bit about the time and place of your mother's books. First, I think that kids read less. Uh, we have the phones and computers and all the screens that they're addicted to. But you know, maybe it's not uh, right to say because when I was a kid, uh, my mother uh, once went to a pre premiere in the theater and uh, a journalist that write a gossip column uh, came up to her and asked her, uh, my, uh, my daughter doesn't read the uh, books. Can you give me an advice what to do? And my mother said, if I had a good advice, I would have uh, used it on my son. Uh, and a week later, the, the headline in the gossip column was Dvo Omer admits that her son doesn't read books. Yeah. And um, so maybe uh, there are some kids that read, some are don't, but there are also the things that uh, um, things are changing. And uh, maybe uh, kids doesn't want to read these kind of stories or these kind of books anymore. Um, I know that there are many that read them today and really love the books. Um, we are trying to um, uh, put them out again with a bigger font to change the cover of the book. And, um, to, to, and, and the biggest uh, compliment com I'm getting about the film that it makes the, the people who saw the film that they feel like they want to read the books again. And hopefully uh, those people will uh, uh, tell their kids about the books. Um, but nothing is forever. And maybe some of the books are, are not uh, uh, communicating today anymore. And were they read in other countries? Yes, she was uh, translated to many uh, languages, even to Japanese. Um, and uh, she was... Um, uh, quite successful with the translations. I know we had somebody researching here and there's um, some of her books are available in translation at the Harvard Library. So for anyone affiliated with interested in checking them out. They can I saw a few of them on Amazon, so check it out. So the, uh, there's another question here about your own relationship to your mother um, and how your relationship to her sh changed in making the film, either your memories of her or your relationship to her work or your memories of your childhood. 
Um, did your relationship to your mom change while making this movie? To be honest, no, because I didn't start the film from a point that I have something to, uh, it's unfinished business with my mom. Uh, I loved her the way she was. I wasn't angry about her. She was a great mom. And uh, I never felt that something is missing in my life. So I didn't have to do, a, a, you know, this trip in order to find myself in, a, in another a point in the end of this uh, uh, road. Um, and, you know, I'm starting the film with this uh, introduction, interaction with this uh, person that's fixing the grave. And I'm telling him that my mother, she doesn't come to me in my dreams. And, uh, what, and he sent me to, the, to her uh, uh, private room, uh, to, the, to her uh, office. And um, maybe something will, will change. And I must tell you, she didn't uh, came to me yet uh, in my dreams. I'm still waiting. <laughs> um, uh, but I didn't need to heal myself in this film. I just needed to tell uh, this story about this great uh, mother person and the uh, author. Yeah. I, I, can I jump in again? Sure. I want to ask you, Ron, about the kibbutz. Maoz Chaim, this is where she grew up. You grew, you grew up not in a kibbutz, right, Ron? You know, no. Um, and um, you grew up in a kibbutz. The values were, were very strict. Um, and they, they, they had to probably uh, hide from your mother the truth about her mother's death. And when I think about it, I get, I get really, really, it, it's so difficult for me to identify with these views, even though I understand the history and the consequences. And, um, but what, what do you think about that, that this part of her life? My mother said that uh, living in uh, the kibbutz in Maoz was like Sparta, uh, the physical way and especially the emotional aspect of it. People didn't talk about their emotions. You, you couldn't cry in public. And nobody understood that uh, a child, 11 years old, can be confused and not to really understand what happened with her mom. So there's no one to blame. It was a different generation. Um, my mother always told me and to my brother and sister, there's nothing to be afraid to ask. And she was afraid to ask, what, what really happened to my, my mother? I don't really understand. And uh, only in the age of 35, she, she found out. And there is no one to blame because they didn't know she was misunderstood what happened. They didn't understand that uh, Kids got uh, need to be approached differently. It was a different, different uh, world. Right, and also it connects with her father telling her, "Come on, I have this mission of these kids from the Holocaust, the, the survivors, the young survivors. They don't have any food. They don't have any clothes. They don't have. A, you have the kibbutz, and they will take care of it." And he, I don't think he was um vicious he just thought that this is his mission right right but you know she never forgave him she never forgave him about that uh, they uh, had uh, relationships he, he edited few of her first books but she never uh, forgave him about that and uh, i can understand her did she confronted with him about this no. question no, no, she couldn't. She couldn't. There's another question here from the audience about um, the footage of your mother staring into the camera, which was so powerful. Where and how was this taken? This footage was part of a video art I wanted to make 20 years ago. Um, I, I shot a few of my friends and I asked my father and mother also to come to the studio. And uh, uh, 
as many good ideas. I finished uh, working on it and I didn't do anything with that. And it was in my uh, drawer, in, uh, in one of the drawers in the house. And when I was uh, approaching to, to work on this film, I knew I had this uh, tape and I, uh, I was very, very happy to find this uh, close up of my mother. I felt it's like the DNA of uh, her soul. Yeah, it is very strong. It is very, very strong. And I don't know if you pay attention, I'm using this uh, shot uh, four times in the film. Uh, each time it's a different part of the shot. And in the last time I'm using it, it's the end shot of the film, she's smiling mm -hmm. and wrinkle her eye. And this is the only time she smiles at the film. Wow. What an amazing gift to yourself to have, to have shot this and yes. be able yes. to use it. Um, there's a question about um, Devorah's stepfather. Did he consider raising her as part of his family? She tried to go to uh, uh, live with them for a while, but he was a very, very tough person. He hardly spoke before his wife died, and he spoke. To, he didn't spoke completely after she died, uh, and she didn't find herself then uh, there. And she stopped coming to their room in the kibbutz. We say room to their house. She stopped uh, coming there, and uh, it didn't work out. She was alone. She was alone in the kibbutz. But I believe this is what made her Dvora Omer. This is what <laughs> made her a person that writes stories. Right. I want to ask a question about the name of the movie. It's beautiful, both in Hebrew and in English, by name and also um, rain in her eyes, right? How did you come, how did you come to this um, beautiful name? My mother always said about herself that she is a girl with rain in her eyes. Um, she's uh, don't uh, do this or don't uh, put me in this situation. You know what's going to happen. I'm going to start crying because I have re rain in my eyes. So uh, at the beginning, I thought about a different name, but in the middle, I understood this is the this is the name for the film. Yeah, this is part of being very sensitive. As a kid, need to be a little bit like a, a grown up and a parent, a little bit, right? Just not give her the trigger to, to cry too much. Am I right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I had another question, um, and I forgot what it was. It was about. Do you have another one, Ariana? <laughs> I, I mean, I do. I'm really interested in sort of the legacy of storytelling. Your your mother wrote her stories and you're telling stories through film, through editing and now in and out through directing. Um, do you see it as a continuation of, of her work? I, I do, yes, because you know, when I was younger, I thought I really like uh, my father. Uh, as I grew up and I find myself a, a alone in a closed room for many, many hours a day, uh, telling stories, uh, I understood we're doing a little bit uh, the same. She wrote her own stories. I mostly um, uh, paint with shots that other people uh, shoot or direct, but I feel like I'm uh, um, creating stories. Um, I really love editing. Um, and it's uh, very close to, to writing. I'm writing with materials, with uh, films. And uh, my mother saying in the film, there is a footage from an archive in black and white. She's saying that she's writing books because she believes that there are some people that we mustn't forget. And uh, when I finished the film, I understood that I did the same. I, I wrote a film so my mother wouldn't be forgotten. And um, you know, I started the, the film with uh, renovating her uh, 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 gravestone, and I'm, I, I understood that this film is a, it's a, a memorial. 
for her. Can you tell me a little bit how was the room that she was writing in? How, how, how did it look? Was it a big window, nice light? Can you give us some? It's what, it was like it was shown in the film. It's not the original room. We, we, the original room is not uh, uh, available as it was. So uh, we, we did it quite, uh, quite the same. Uh -huh. uh, it's a real memory of me going every morning to, to school or kindergarten and coming back at noontime and me passing uh, the window and seeing her writing. And she, I she think. Typing yeah. and it, it was she was looked like she's really in a in a in a different world. Yeah. Well, I have another one. I, I go, go for it. I wanted to ask you, Arne, if you have a favorite book from her uh, that you like the best. Yes, yes, I think so. It's called Pit uh, Ombe Suddenly in the middle of life. It's none of the. It's not one of the classicals, but it's a. It's a book I really love. Uh -huh. Do you read her books to your children? Uh, I try to. Um, I don't know if they're doing it for to me in purpose, but they they prefer uh, sometimes other books. But I have now my youngest. She's a uh, one year and seven months. And she really, really loved the books of Ron Fell and uh, Hurt His Leg. She's uh, really into it. Um, so she, she's giving me some comfort. And you said you didn't read, you didn't read her books as much when you were, when you were young. What, what was it like to hear her voice in, on the page versus, you know, were you able to read her books without thinking this is my mother talking to me? Um, I read some of the books when I was a child and the rest I, I uh, read later on. Uh, and I'm talking to you from my editing room. So here I spent uh, the time editing the film and it was all covered with my mother books. And every time I uh, uh, needed to look for something that uh, can be in the film, I just like, you know, opened and closed many, many books. And then... Um, there is something about my mother's writing that I can, I can hear her voice. It's a, it's something that I, I believe also my brother and sister can can feel that her words. It's her own words. Uh, it's something I. It's very familiar to me. Well, what a gift, and and thank you for um, making this film and and sharing her voice um, with us all and with this audience in Boston and with the new generation. I, I, I'm sure that the film will, will bring a whole new generation of readers to your mother's work. So thank you and thank you for joining us and thank you Yael for the beautiful conversation. Um, thank you everybody, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you everyone for joining us. The film is available through March 10th. So please tell your friends to watch it if they haven't yet. And this conversation will be available for them to hear after the film. So have a good afternoon and we will hopefully see you all at 4 p.m. Thank you again, Yael. Thank you, Ron. Bye, thank you.